Coming up on Market to Market, some farmers may see dramatically less money in the cash box this season. And preservationists document the history of the American farm. Those stories and market analysis with Mark Gold next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, February 13 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. With a few more dollars in their pockets and reduced pain at the pump, consumers opened their wallets a tiny bit more last month. According to the Commerce Department, U.S. retail sales fell eight-tenths of one percent last month. But when the volatile auto sector is removed, retail sales actually ticked up one-tenth of one point. Despite being worth half of what it was a year ago, oil continues to hold on just above the $50 per barrel mark as crude prices hit a two-month high at the end of the week. The upward trend is being attributed to a lower drilling rig count. That bump in oil prices pushed Wall Street higher as the Dow Jones Industrial Average flirted with another record. And the U.S. trade deficit grew to its highest level in two years as consumers bought more imported goods. The move led economists to ponder the potentially bearish implications for U.S. jobs and payrolls. As the old adage goes, the cure for high prices is high prices. And nowhere is that more evident than in farm country. Commodity prices have declined from 2012's record highs, and the USDA is tracking that drop as rural America takes it on the chin. USDA released net farm income projections for 2015, and the prediction is a dramatic drop for America's producers. The forecast is down 32 percent as commodity prices remain lower with expenses creeping higher. Crop receipts are expected to decline by 8 percent, driven by corn trading under $4 per bushel and soybeans in the $10 range. If realized, this would be the second consecutive year of declining revenue and the lowest in more than five years. In 2014, receipts fell 16% from the previous year. The projection for 2015 is $73.6 billion. The record was in 2013 with $129 billion in farm income. However, input expenses for fertilizer and seed are forecast to rise by one half of a percent in 2015. One bright spot is the livestock sector, continuing on 2014 gains as hog producers realized exceptional profits, even with herds damaged by the PED virus. Cattle populations have also been slow to build following the years of drought in key beef production states. Large equipment manufacturers like John Deere and Caterpillar have already forecast lower sales figures as farmers are expected to have less income to spend on new purchases. Another USDA report issued this week shows California remains the top state in gross farm receipts at just under $50 billion, about 10 percent of the nation's total. Iowa remains in second place with more than $35 billion on the line. More than half of the nation's farm receipts come from production in just nine states. The Agriculture Department reported late last week that fiscal years 2009 through 2014 were the strongest six years in history for U.S. agricultural trade. Despite policies that restrict American products in some lucrative foreign markets, U.S. agricultural exports soared to an all-time high of $152.5 billion last year and supported more than one million domestic jobs. None of that would be possible, however, without a modern system of production agriculture that has made the American farmer the envy of his counterparts all over the world. Still, some are concerned that the same technological advancements that enable fewer farmers to produce a seemingly unlimited supply of food also pose a significant threat to the pastoral ideal of the American farm. An important program in the heartland is working to preserve that legacy by listening to those who remember. Paul Yeager explains. Barns, 
the symbol of American agriculture, are disappearing from the rural landscape at an alarming rate. Time takes its toll, and structures that were once vitally important in daily farm operations often fall into disrepair and are either torn down or collapse. And as the iconic buildings fade into history, America also loses a way of life. It's important to preserve the really unique in the everyday. Um, because when you look back at our life, um, you know, it isn't just about uh, the church or the theater. It's those everyday places that we spend our days uh, that we want to remember what our daily life was like, right? And the work we did. And so one day, 50, 60 years from now, I mean, the world we see, most people are going to, it's going to be a distant memory of, and, and so we need to have some icons to kind of give us a glimpse back. 200 years ago, 90% of the population farmed. Today, it's just 2%, and the average age of those that farm keeps increasing. According to the 2012 Census of Agriculture, 57% of those who farm are 55 years or older. To broaden what is already known about a disappearing way of life, Iowa silos and smokestacks, the only historic district in the country devoted to farming and industries related to agriculture, and the Grout Museum in Waterloo are working together to compile oral histories from people involved in farming. I think the 1930s to the 1970s is indeed that greatest generation for, for farming because they had gone through so much, the depression in 1921, the depression of the 1930s, uh, the really hard times, particularly in the mid-30s. Uh, then coming out of that, World War II is this tremendous boom period. 70s, you see this explosion of farming, followed by those horrible 80s, which, you know, just devastated folks who had expanded a bit too much, had taken too many chances, and uh, were overextended. And the farmers that I talked to, they talk about the 1980s, and they say, you know, we should have known that. You know, we should have known that because the same thing happened in the 1920s, and to some extent it happened a bit in the 50s. But we didn't learn. We didn't remember. Over the past century, there have been revolutionary changes in agriculture, technological advancements and how seeds are both planted and harvested. The innovations have enabled U.S. farmers to produce 262% more food with 2% fewer inputs than what was grown just 65 years ago. We need to be able to tell, particularly school kids, what the life was like 40 years, 50 years ago, and how a farm might look today. And so by engaging people with stories, we get that attention from them that they might not give a panel on the wall that they had to read. According to Niemeyer, farmers are great storytellers, and it's often difficult to limit their conversation to just two hours. If I try to pull the emotions uh, of of what it means to be a farmer, but we also want to get the facts, okay? I mean, you know, as, as Fred Strobin was talking about this morning, you know, he could sort of tell you it took X number of minutes to pick by hand, you know, and, and now you can do it in, in virtually no time at all. Back in the 30s, we only got, we didn't have hybrid seed, we didn't use any fertilizer, and we only expected to get 40 to 60 bushels a acre. Gradually, there were a few people who would brag about 100 bushel corn, but those people that got 100 bushel corn, either they lied a lot or they had a lot of, of uh, they might have a, a dairy herd and they might put uh, 10 tons of, of cattle manure on, the, on their per acre. That way they would get enough nitrogen they could. We like to ask the question, what will farming be like in 10 years? You know, 10 years ago, we would have said, what would the farming be like in 25, 30 years? Because we thought it was going to take that long to change. Now we realize that in 10 more years, farming will have changed so much. You know, and the older farmers, they have some sense of, of why things have changed, and they have some opinions of whether it's good or not. Uh, now the new combines and, and uh, 
you pretty much stay in the cab. And when you got some of them, even if you get out of the cab, the machine will turn itself off, and, and which is a good safety factor. Live as though you're going to die tomorrow. Farm as though you're going to farm forever. It's easy in today's world to take agriculture for granted. But from 1933 to today, the population of the world has grown from 2 billion to 7 billion. A farmer somewhere raised most of the food you eat, produced at least some of the materials used in making your clothes, and even helped fuel some of the nation's 253 million cars. While advancements in agriculture have left an indelible mark on virtually every aspect of modern life, it's still important to preserve crucial parts of the American experience, whether they are barns or vivid stories of how things used to be. After all, history never looks like history when you're living through it. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Next, the Market to Market Report. Exports to China, higher fuel prices, and a cheaper dollar pushed grain prices higher. For the week, March wheat gained six cents, while the nearby corn contract moved almost two cents higher. Soybeans continued to advance as the March contract added 17 cents. Nearby meal prices followed suit with a gain of $2.90 per ton. In the softs, cotton continued its rally this week as the May contract advanced by $1.69 per hundredweight. Class 3 milk futures gave up all of last week's gains and then some as the nearby contract lost 44 cents and the deferred contract fell by nearly 70 cents. Livestock recovered some of last week's losses as the April cattle contract gained $2.20. Nearby feeders rose by $4.40. However, the April lean hog contract continued its decline, moving $3.25 lower. In the currency market, the euro continued its series of tiny upward moves, gaining almost one basis point against the dollar. Crude oil advanced $1.09 per barrel. Comex gold declined by $7.50 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index gained almost 12 points to settle at 420.65. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Mark Gold. Mark, welcome back. Thanks. Nice to be here again. Well, and we're glad to have you. And I want to jump right into this wheat market. We saw some news internationally this week, and I wanted your take on how that Ukrainian ceasefire might impact this wheat market. Could that be a bearish factor as we move through this year? Well, the, the Ukrainian situation has been hot and cold several times over the last several months. I don't know that that's going to be the biggest factor in here. Our wheat is still pretty expensive around the world. In fact, the most expensive wheat in the world. But we've seen a nice little price rise here. And it certainly looks to me like we can move it a little bit higher yet. We're trying to form a little bit of a bottom in this market. And the wheat market doesn't act all bad. And it's kind of being led up by the March-May spread, which I like to see. We first time we've had the March-May over even money in quite some time. I think it closed around two, two and a half cents over, which is a good sign for this wheat market. So even though we've got plenty of supplies around the world, record world carryouts, we're still seeing a little bump in this wheat price. What is it about the March-May spread that makes it a, a nice tool for folks to look at? Well, one of the indicators is, you know, how much demand do we have up front? And if we start seeing that get a little tight up front, which we've seen, we've gone from five or six cents under to about two cents over, two and a half cents over. We actually got, I think, as far out as four cents over today. So that's an indication that there's a little nearby demand. But I think you've got to keep in mind these world carryouts at 196 million metric tons. There was a lot of wheat. The dollar was down over a penny this week, so that helped our wheat prices a little bit here. But the dollar is still awful high. The dollar might come down some more, but again, it's still relatively high, and we expect over time the dollar is going to work higher. Okay, so so all of those factors being said, you'd still hold off a little bit and try to put a little more uh, a little more upside on this market before making some sales. Yeah, we we've actually on last year's crop we're long out of last year's crop, and for this year we're about thirty I think thirty thirty five percent sold. But we bought back some call options about two weeks ago on some of this wheat, 
and that looks like it might have some legs to it. So we haven't gone whole hog in. We've got 50% of it covered, and I think there's still some more upside potential in this wheat market. All right, and so far, no big stories about winter kill despite the slim slow snow cover, and we're just going to have to wait and see how they come out of dormancy. You know, wheat on Friday was up uh, 10, 12 cents, and I think part of that's been some of the cold weather that is coming into the Midwest this weekend, and there's a little bit more talk about winter kill. But I think we always have to keep in the back of our mind that wheat's pretty much a weed out there, and it's got to be pretty severe, and I think we'll get through that. I think the next real threat for this crop could be some kind of frost, but we're talking two, three months out, and that'll be maybe the next big play in the wheat market. All right. Well, let's jump down into the corn market. We're still seeing some relative stability and, and a little bit of strength. Does it look like that's going to continue? Well, you know, we've seen some pretty good exports in here, despite the strong dollar. The corn market, we had a double bottom at 76, 376 in the March contract. We took that out, came right back, and now we're kind of stuck in this 380 to 390 range. If we can close over 390 anytime soon, like you know, early next week after we come back from the long weekend, I'd say that'd be a positive sign, and even corn can move a little bit higher here. Uh, I think we're trying to buy some acres. We've got this averaging period now for the crop insurance, and I think they're going to try to ensure that we don't lose too many corn acres out there to beans. So, well, you know, firm price between now and the end of the month certainly wouldn't surprise me. Now, the export numbers were much higher than analysts' expectations this week. Is that an indication that maybe China's come into this market, or are we confident they're not going to be a buyer for a while? Well, I think the Chinese have their own problems. They've got the... Uh, the holiday coming up in China, so we don't expect them to be a big player in the next week or two. But overall, the Chinese are going to continue to be buyers of some grain. And again, it's a world supply and demand, whether they get it from us or whether they get it from South America. But the fact of the matter is they have been good buyers. It's firmed up the market. If we can get that close over 390 and then again, if the March can close over $4, that's even more significant. That's been kind of a psychological area. So I'm not I wouldn't say I'm bearish right here at the moment on corn. I think we still want to make sure we get those acres in the ground. And so that being said, is on the December corn, we're not in a rush to make any sales at this point. Would you hold off and see how we finish February? For the time being, yeah. We've Again, we're, we've got about 30% sold of our new crop corn out here. And we haven't really bought calls back. If we start closing over three dollars bucks again, we'll start laying into some of the call options out there. But the corn market certainly looks like it's got a little bit of upside to it. I, I think relative particularly to soybeans, it's got some real good potential longer term. Well, I think that leads us right into In our soybeans. next discussion. On the soybeans, um, it, it does seem like we've seen exports trail back a little bit, although they were surprising this week. Yep. Um, any thoughts on that? Is that an indication that maybe South America's having some trouble getting beans out? No, we don't see that. Uh, okay. we, we think their harvest is going pretty well. They're going to have a huge crop, whether it's 95 million metric tons or 94. I'm not sure it's going to make a whole lot of difference when we got world carryouts that are up almost 50% from a year ago. And I think there are a couple of key things in this bean market. We are going to put more bean acres into the ground. If we have anywhere near trend line yield, you're looking at increasing these carryouts from 385 to some bigger number, perhaps over 500 million. And one of the bigger problems is some of the situations down in South America. If Argentina continues with their political unrest, the Argentinian farmers have been sitting on a lot of soybeans out there looking for better prices and for the dollar to re interact with their currency. And now with the political instability, and there's plenty of it down there, could the Argentinians get more aggressive in selling? I think that's a wild card the market hasn't looked at yet. And with more acres, bigger carryouts, the soybean market could be the one that really could be the, the one that lags behind here. Now, that being said, the Argentinian crop, now, of course, their political scene has truly been a soap opera yes. these past couple of weeks. How are yields expected to be in Argentina? You know, they're looking at pretty good yields uh, all the way across the board, corn and beans. So we don't see that that's an issue. Uh, again, as we head into our planting season here, everybody wants to talk about our acres and how, you know, what, what's the shift to be? Are we going to put two or three million more acres of beans in, that much less corn? Well, I think it comes down to what we're going to add another two plus million acres of beans. I don't think the corn numbers are going to be down as much. The farmers I've been talking to, and I've been traveling all over the country the last three months, uh, doesn't seem like they're willing to really cut back. And now that we've got this bump in the price in December corn, we're up around the three, 415 area. I think that's going to be enough incentive for guys maybe not to cut as much back. I think the bean acres might come out of the cotton. So with cotton with these low prices, I'm probably a little friendly on the cotton market here. All right. But... When we were talking a year ago at this time, 
I mentioned that I didn't think it was the price was going to be about an acreage game, and I still feel that this year. I think the price game is going to be about the yield. If we have a drought, no matter what acres we get into the ground, we're going to have significantly higher prices, corn, beans, and wheat. If we get whatever the number is in these, in these soybean and corn acres in the ground and we have good weather, then we've got an awful lot of risk in this market yet. That being said, the risk that's out there, particularly let's talk about the soybean market, does it make sense to get some sales booked here on this rally for your November beans? Absolutely. You know, we're at 960. It's not great with the basis, but you can reown it. And I would certainly, if you're selling 960 beans, invest some money in a call option as you're making those sales in case we do have a drought or some other situation. But there can be significant risk yet in this bean market, maybe as much as $2, maybe more, if we have as good a crop. I think we found out last year, even with problems in northern Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, uh, in um, Wisconsin, that if we can have a 47, 48 bushel yield, what are we going to have if we have great weather around the entire Midwest? Can we pump up that yield to 50? I believe we can. Oh. I believe the genetics are that good today. So add that to two or three million more acres, and that tells me that there could be significant risk in this bean market yet. All right. Well, now you mentioned some of these bean acres coming out of cotton, and we've yeah. seen cotton on a nice little rally here these yep. past three weeks. Is that cotton trying to buy back some acres from beans? I think beans? it is. Um, I was just in the south. I spent uh, almost a full week in Mississippi traveling around the entire state, putting on some meetings, and the general consensus is more beans, less cotton down there. And I've certainly seen it, and they've over the last two years, they've actually they've had a lot of catfish ponds being turned back into fields, and a lot of that's going into soybeans out here. So the cotton, I think, needs to want to say, hey, don't forget about us out here. And uh, we've had such an incredible break from 225 down to you know 50 some odd cents in this cotton that I think cotton's trying to hold their own in here, and it, it should. And probably still has to climb a little bit more to be competitive with the current $10 beans. Yeah, I would think we need to get cotton somewhere in the 75 to 80 cent range to, to do that, and I think that's within reason. So probably hold off on some sales on this nearby, let it see if we can yeah, grow some wh strength. What I would do is buy a cheap put out there, buy a 55 cent put, don't spend more than two or three cents on something, in case, because the long-term risk is still significant in this cotton market. But I think we've got a chance between now and the springtime to maybe see a little bounce. But if I'm wrong, we don't want to play that speculating game. So we're going to manage the risk by having a cheap put underneath us. Gotcha. Well, now let's jump down into the livestock market this week. Uh, we did kind of see a turnaround on the fat cattle side. We saw it climb a little bit. Um, cash still staying strong. Yeah. When do you expect this futures market to, to kind of correct a little bit to the upside to hook in with cash? Well, we tried to do that today. Um, I'm not so sure we're going to accomplish as much as some people would like it to accomplish. I look at this cattle chart, and I look at the fundamentals in this cattle. We've turned a tide in terms of numbers out there, in terms of demand. Now, the stock market is strong. The economy looks to be good. Guys have more money in their pocket because of the gasoline, and they might spend a little bit more on beef. So that's all good. What isn't good is when you look, if you put up a, a cotton chart, a 30-year cotton chart, you put up a 30-year cattle chart, and you see the kind of risk we did have in that cotton market from 225 down to 56 or 57. I'm not suggesting, you know, feeders are going to 57 bucks by any means, but at $200, is their risk down to 150 or lower? You bet there is. And I believe over time, as we start building these numbers, of which, would, which we're doing, there's more numbers coming ahead, uh, that's going to be an issue for this cattle market. So we've had a nice rally here. We've bounced $10, $11 off the lows that we've made. Uh, I'm more bearish the cattle maybe than anything else here, and I am imploring guys, spend money on these puts. They aren't cheap by any stretch of the imagination. But to spend $5 to protect $50 of risk is a 10 to 1 risk-reward ratio, and that's a trade I'm willing to make out here. And it's a trade that we saw would have paid off dropping that market from 246 down to two even or 194 yeah. in the March. Uh, so there's big swings. Big swings in this market. And, you know, the, when we look at the risk, one of the things I've been talking about in the seminars lately is the extent of the risk. And it's always much greater than most farmers think it is. When we had dollar $160 feeder cattle, 180, who would have thought we could have gone to 240 and higher? Who would have thought that 
Cotton could have gone from 225 to 57. The risk is always much greater. Look at the Swiss franc two weeks ago. In five minutes, it rallied $25,000 a contract. So the risk is generally a lot greater than most people think would be. And I'd say the risk in this cattle is certainly there. All right. Now let's jump down into the hog market. We've got a question here from uh, one of our Facebook viewers. He's curious, how is the labor dispute and the West Coast port shutdown having an effect on markets? And I think we've seen the biggest in the pork. Would that be correct? Yeah, pork and, you know, the wheat market and the grains to some extent, cattle. It's, it's affected at all. Uh, are we going to see it continue? I really doubt it. I, you know, they've got the federal arbitrators in there now, and I think they're going to probably come to an end to this pretty, you know, the, the strikes have never proven to be a really great union tool out here. Uh, and I don't think that it's going to last too long. If it lasts, all we're going to do is back up product, and that's not healthy for the market. So it's not maybe very, maybe a little friendly in the very near, near term, but longer term, uh, we've got more product we need to sell. So what are your thoughts on this hog market? Down three bucks today? Does it look like we're going to continue to grind lower, or do you think we'll find you know, the, the bottom? The cash hogs, they're talking about next week seeing heavy hogs and a fair number of hogs coming in. But we've had a nice drop in this hog market, and we've gotten down into levels here that if you look at some of the long-term cycles and where we're at over 30 years, I don't want to get too bearish down here. Again, could we see 45 or $40 hogs? Yeah, we could. So would I be buying some kind of cheap put out there to protect it? I would. But if you're making sales down here at these levels, would I want to own a call option as we head into the summer months? And because we're at such low levels, I would. And if I'm using pork products, I'd certainly want to be pricing some down here. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark, thank for you, joining Mike. us this week. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Mark and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our Market Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts and streaming video of our program exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we'll examine a legal dispute over water quality in Iowa that could have sweeping ramifications for farmers all over the country. So until next time, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.